Martin, I know some of the people are still down at the specialty, but hopefully they'll get up here quickly, and especially if they've already been judged dogs. And um, I, uh, I have to tell you that I picked up this book. I saw it in an airport, of all things. It was on the New York bestseller list, and I always go to that, that kiosk that says New York bestseller. And I look down, and I read the backs, and I saw the German Shepherd, and I went, oh my god. <laughs> I can't like this book <laughs> because anybody that's written about a German Shepherd probably doesn't know the dog. And I started reading the pages as I was waiting for my plane and I couldn't believe how exciting it was. And then I couldn't go to bed that night because I had to finish the book. So that is how I started to learn about Cat Warren. And then I found a very dear friend, Ellen, who had actually met Cat Warren. And she said, well, why don't you call her? And I, so I did, and we talked, and that's how Kat was able to come here, and she graciously. Thank you, Deborah. And uh, so just a little bit about Kat. Um, she had a dog that was incorrigible, as some of us have had and uh, was looking some, to do something special with this dog and found his thing, as all of our dogs have, maybe one special thing that they do better than the others or that they excel in or that they just demand that we do with them. And that was her dog. And uh, so she started working him in the cadaver work. And the story is basically about that dog and all the wonderful things that she has done and, and, and that we are so grateful for as a great example of a German Shepherd dog. Um, beyond just our own pleasure, but to be able to help others and put closure on them, which is so important. Um, Kat also, besides being a fabulous writer, um, is a university <coughs> professor. And uh, so she gets to uh, really um, make an impression on many, many people. Uh, positive and negative. Many, many, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure all positive. I would love to be in her class. But anyway, so grateful for Kat being here. And welcome, Kat Warren. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, yes, I wouldn't be here without Ellen and Deborah and the other numerous people who helped Mary Ellen. And um, I'm going to talk for maybe 40, 45 minutes and then open it for a discussion. I know that people are tired. Can everybody hear me in the back? Is that good, but not too, too echoey? Um, I'll give a little bit of background. Um, uh, I have to say that this is not this sort of pulls things a little out of whack, this screen. So um, he looks a little skinnier there than he um, was in real life. But um, as, as Deborah said, all dogs, yeah, I mean, he was so damned cute. And he was four and a half weeks old here. And, um, and he was a singleton. And that was really the beginning of all my problems. <laughs> and um, his wonderful breeder, this is one of the things, we could, we're among German Shepherd breeders. Um, sadly, the, um, the, the, her male had injured his hawk, and so she decided at the last minute that she ne needed to do artificial insemination, and her usual guy wasn't available, and sadly, um, uh, it, it wasn't an ideal job with the straws. So, um, so I got the news. I'd been on her wait list for like a year and a half. Uh, Sola was a West German dog and got the news of, well, uh, Vita has had her litter. <laughs> and this was it. This was the litter. And um, I don't know how many of you have ever experienced singletons, but um, they're a problem. And um, they can tend to be dog aggressive, people aggressive, um, partly because that early socialization that pups give each other in a litter is just missing. And Joan tried incredibly hard to find a nearby litter, but there wasn't one 
recent enough that it wouldn't have gone south kind of badly. Um, and I remember reading Patricia McConnell, um, who wrote The Other End of the Leash and who has Border Collie is a wonderful um, dog training books. And she talked about that moment when she had a singleton Border Collie and actually thought about um, uh, putting him to sleep because she had seen in her training practice so many dogs that um, were just issues. So, um, so Solo was an issue. Um, he flunked out of, I think, four or five puppy classes, as did I. Um, I remember that uh, I ended the relationship I'd had for many years with an obedience uh, trainer who simply said, uh, this dog is going to end up biting you or somebody. Um, he was already biting me a lot. <laughs> he had no bite inhibition. But what he did have was he had a lot of drive and, um, and he was a really smart little guy. The thing that he did get from being a singleton is that Joan took him everywhere. And one of the things that happened is while he was dog aggressive, he was not in the least bit people aggressive. He really loved, people were his people. Um, and, and that helped us as well. And so when he was about five months old, I took him to a trainer that I knew. Um, and she had experienced my prior shepherd who was um, mild and kind hearted. And as Nancy said, really boring. <laughs> And, and I said, what do, what do I do? And, um, and she informed me that search and rescue probably wasn't a great thing to do with him because I teach and I can't like pop away from the classroom. I mean, search and rescue really is the you drop everything. Um, and, um, and she was the one who said, why don't you think about cadaver work? And I said, what's that? <laughs> and she told me and I said, well, you know, that sounds rather interesting. And, um, and so I, I worked with him and I was really lucky in that you know how sometimes things are just serendipitous. So here's this dog who I'm not sure I like at all um, and who is a handful. And I simply didn't have the background or the training to deal with him, but um, uh, but Nancy was a good trainer, and pretty early on, uh, I got hooked up with a woman who were still really close friends in the medical examiner's office who'd had cadaver dogs, and she um, suggested that I get up with, I'm in Durham, we have a fairly high crime rate in Durham, she suggested I get up with the canine sergeant in Durham, um, and I emailed him and said, here's the situation, and he said, uh, come train, see what, you, see what you think. And um, Mike and I are still incredibly close. We still train together. Uh, I learned so much from him. And of course, having the opportunity to um, train with the canine unit, um, you, you just get to see a lot of dogs doing a lot of things and, um, and I just think that there's nothing more fun in the world than watching dogs do scent work. Um, I was, you know, how I gave this wonderful presentation about nose work and, um, and part of the pleasure to me is as much as anything being able not to just work my own dog, but watching other dogs work and being able to stand back and, and, and see what each of these dogs does. But here's the problem. <laughs> And there is a problem with this. And um, uh, I, I, Hallie and I were talking, and I said, I'm, I'm going to be, Deborah resented this, I said, I'm going to be Debbie Downer, because I'm going to be the one who says, you know what? There are limits to dogs' noses. Not all dogs like this work. Um, there are limits to dogs' noses, partly because there are limits to handlers and what handlers can do. Um, and so, one of the things that I did in working on the book was to kind of go out and start to figure out what it is we know or don't know about the dog and his nose. And this is a really crappy uh, picture, as you can see. But this is, um, this is a page from early. Just imagine, if you will, if this were not horribly reproduced. Um, on this page is 
a ferret, a deer, Rosie, who was a javelina, and Greta, who was a red Duroc pig. And what happened is post Vietnam War, just post Vietnam War, there was actually a lot of military research money hanging around and people had started to see what the dogs could do in Vietnam. And, um, and researchers were bored and thought, well, we have to see if something other than the dog will work for this kind of work. So there's a place called SWERI, Southwest Research Institute down in Texas that has more money than they know what to do with. And they decided to test out all of these different animals to see if they were any better at this work than dogs. Um, as you can imagine, the deer, not so great, wonderful nose, a little flighty, right? Um, they found that the raccoons were great until they became juveniles and started biting people. Um, Greta, the red Duroc pig, had a wonderful handler, a, a, a very small woman, and Greta was amazing. And of course, what they discovered was that for mine detection, um, pigs' noses just blew dogs' noses out of the water. This, this pig could detect mines further down than you can imagine, and of course there was only one problem. Um, <laughs> they root. <laughs> and you, you, you really do want a passive alert uh, if you're doing mine detection. So, um, and of course, I mean, law enforcement is not, as you can imagine, going to want to have a pig in the back seat. Plus, Greta became, um, red Durocs are known for their weight gain. That's one of the, I mean, they're, they've got great noses, but um, by the time Greta got to be 300 pounds, Sweary decided that they were going to have a barbecue. Oh, no. Yes. No, I actually got a hold of the widow of one of the researchers, and she remembers what a nice barbecue it was. <laughs> so, so, I know. It's, it, this is just what happens. It's just, you know. Um, so, so, of course, the, the research narrowed, and they realized that not, they actually tried uh, coyote beagle mixes, they tried wolves, we know how that turned out. Um, uh, and I actually, one of the researchers, one of the army researchers, gave me a whole stack of his Polaroids. And I just want to point a couple things out. Um, several shepherds in here. In the upper right hand corner, you can't quite see, but there's a really beautiful woman in a polka dot mini skirt there, and she's got a standard poodle. And one of the things that happened was that this was the era of um, uh, hijacking planes. Um, yeah, so, so they decided that they were going to put either lap dogs or poodles in the airports with, um, uh, with law enforcement officers who were both beautiful and well-dressed, and that the dogs would paw the handler's arm when they detected guns. If you think about it, this was like they did not know how to address this problem. So this was very early on. And the dogs were very good at it, right? And they used, I mean, there were a number of lap dogs that did just, um, just fine with that work. And, um, and of course, I mean, the, the rest is history. One of the things I will note, you see that shepherd just sitting there in the middle. Um, there's, a, there's a trip wire. Um, and uh, just in front of him. And of course that wire creates a vibration and dogs can hear it. And one of the things that was learned in Vietnam to um, sort of the a kind of enormous tragedy is they actually tried bloodhounds in Vietnam. And you, you just cannot stop a bloodhound, right? And um, they, I'm sad to say, blew up several bloodhounds um, before they realized that they needed a dog like a German Shepherd who has a little more um, discernment, is not a kind of single purpose dog. So, um, and early on, they did experiments with um, a cadaver dog work, and those two bottom photos are that. And one of the interesting things early on was that um, the Army was loath to use actual human remains because the notion of what happens to a soldier 
um, after he or she dies is a pretty important thing. And out of sort of a, a sense of respect, the early researcher, his name was Nick Montanarelli, and he actually helped develop the bulletproof vest as well. But they used, um, how do I say this nicely? Macerated monkey meat. Thinking, of course, that monkeys would be kind of close to humans. But what we are beginning to learn, of course, is that there are real differences between the volatiles that come off um, uh, different kinds of human remains or animal remains. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the fact is, is that it worked. Um, uh, and, and the dogs did just fine. Um, there was enough in common. I just, I want to point out that one of the things that you realize when you look at noses and purposes, and Helen and I were talking about this, this is an African pouch, giant pouched rat. Um, have, are any of you familiar with this critter? So they are using them um, pretty much um, everywhere that there are landmines, and especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, here's the advantage. Actually, there are several advantages, okay? Um, this little critter doesn't care who the handler is, okay? Um, they keep them starved and give them essentially uh, a meal of mushed up banana. And so these little guys are always hungry. And the most important thing is that they will not explode the landmines going across the land. So you can see, right, a dog is going to get blown up in this situation. They can send these little rats out and their little tiny feet will not trigger the landmines and they're incredibly useful. And they're actually using them too to detect tuberculosis, which is a huge problem um, in many uh, underdeveloped countries. So, um, so and, and their lifespan is actually, they live um, like five, six to eight years. Not bad, right? So, um, so it's kind of interesting to watch those dogs being used. So what do we have today? Well, I know all of you are familiar with these sort of different kinds of scent detection. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about um, tracking and trailing, and if we can pull off the demo tomorrow, um, uh, we will sort of look at the difference at what happens in search. How many of you have, do search and rescue? Is there anybody in here who does search and rescue? Um, so ha, is anybody familiar with sort of um, the sort of the trailing dog? Um, so. Um, we want these dogs to cut corners. Um, that's their job. So if you have, for instance, in law enforcement, what you call a jump and run, um, uh, and, and that's, it's gonna be a short track. Um, you, the dog is going to um, be moving very, very quickly. And, um, and you don't want the dog making um, hard left or hard right turns. That dog is going to be using both scent on the ground and in the air, kind of multi-purposing to get as quickly as possible to the suspect. Um, this, is a, this is a really lovely uh, bloodhound from Greensboro PD. Greensboro, North Carolina still has several really good uh, law enforcement bloodhounds. And, um, and it's just to point out that the, the more we know about the chemicals that are involved with this stuff, the more we realize how complex live human scent is. Um, and, um, and, and one of the things that, um, that you learn more and more is like, how long can it survive? And we'll talk about some of the myths that are out there. Um, I also want to talk in a, a little bit about sort of the law enforcement dog. And I was thinking that when Hallie was talking, just this notion of somebody was asking about a little bit of cross training with one of their dogs, right? Can you do, can you do tracking and canine nose work? And where, how do you want to do that? Well, if you think about the standard patrol dog, 
that dog is doing usually narcotics detection, they're doing tracking trailing, they're doing bite work, okay? Um, and you're having to keep that dog up on all those different things, right? And if you think about drugs, you even have the added complication where some drugs are no longer illegal. So what happens to law enforcement dogs when marijuana becomes legal in a state like Washington? <laughs> can you untrain a dog? And uh, some dogs can be untrained pretty quickly if, if you're not going to give them a paycheck. They <laughs> said, well, forget that. I'm not going to alert on marijuana anymore. But th that's not always the case. Um, how many of, have any of you done bite work or schutzend? A, f a few hands. So one of the things that, um, that is hard for people to understand about bite work in law enforcement is that it has similarities to schutzend, but a lot of dissimilarities, okay? A street dog, you want him to bite whatever thing he can hold on to or she can hold on to. And I met with and trained with a cop. This is a, a green dog down in the Everglades, okay? Learning how to do bite work in the water. Because guess what? There's a lot of water in Florida. Um, and if you think about how complicated this is for a dog, the sort of environmental hardness that you have to have. But this is also the trainer who makes darn sure that those dogs are not just interested in a sleeve, right? Because the sleeve becomes the target and should send and you don't want the dog coming in and grabbing your leg. But law enforcement dogs, if they're trained on sleeves and not weaned off of the sleeves, sometimes don't even know how to bite a bare arm, right? They need to learn how to do that. And so, um, so bite work becomes so much more complicated once you're dealing with patrol dogs and you're thinking about the fact that the dog is tracking trailing somebody, finding them, doing in principle a bark and hold and then going in for a bite. Think about how many different functions are involved. And one of the things that, that good canine cops do is you train on stairs. You train on people hiding immobile under buildings. You train in absolutely every circumstance you can think of. You train on somebody being up on a table and the dog being willing to jump up on the table or jump on top of a car. Um, uh, these are um, the other common uses, obviously. Um, drugs, article searches. Uh, we talked a little bit in the canine nose work about what sort of sense, but uh, you know, when we're out training the dogs, they need to be able not only to trail somebody, but they need to be able to go out and find if somebody has dropped a gun, right? That becomes part of the chain of evidence. And so the dogs are trained on dropped wep weapons, right? Um, accelerance is less common, and usually those are specialty dogs, but uh, fire detection dogs who can figure out whether accelerants have been used in a fire, so if it was arson. Um, it's astonishing that there's actually no machine that can detect use of those accelerants to the degree that dogs can, right? Um, I'm, I'm going to brag on this dog a little bit. Um, Nero is a, a, a beautiful Malinois. Actually, it wasn't beautiful at all. He had his front teeth blown out. Um, he had one ear partly blown off by an IED. He had his tail blown off by an IED. Um, he, the handler was killed, but the dog went on to drag himself back to camp and helped uh, save a number of other um, uh, soldiers. And he had post-traumatic stress, basically, but he was such a good dog that he 
quietly was turned over to a police department and went on to have four more years um, as a patrol dog. Um, and I trained with him several times and he was such a lovely dog. This is a dog that you could take into an elementary school, which trust me, you can't do with all the Malinois. <laughs> in police departments, but Nero was one of those dogs who was just um, so darn good. And they basically, he, he was retrained. Um, he was essentially a special forces dog, and he just became a patrol dog and had a great career. When we think about, we always say, well, you know, the dog has a sp special purpose. This is a dog that was basically good at everything. Um, his handler adored him. Um, and then, of course, there are these scents. Whatever you want to train a dog on, if you can isolate that scent, you can train the dog on that scent. So, um, so we know about bed bug detection, et cetera, et cetera. There's, um, there, these are not law enforcement dogs, but, but there are the wildlife conservation dogs who are out trained on various kinds of scat. Um, how many of you have heard about the, the dogs that go out in the, in, in the ocean, in the bays, to look for whales, right? This is, so it's, it, so what, what the, the guy who's doing that research at University of Washington, um, so you know how hope floats, right? Poop floats too. So, um, so what they realized is that they could track the health of whales and killer whales um, because without disturbing the pods, they, the, the poop would float for a little while and the dogs could detect it up from a mile away and they would just steer the boats in, scoop that up and actually analyze it and know exactly what was happening. Sadly, what's happening right now is that whales and killer whales are starving to death. Uh, there's just not enough food out there for them. So. So here's, here's Solo. You can tell that he's West German by that roach in his back. <laughs> he did have a little roach in his back. And when he detected cadaver, well, uh, one of the things Hallie was talking about is getting to know what a, your particular dog does when he gets in scent. And um, Solo would always roach his back a little more when he found cadaver scent. And he would get that, he had a very long tail, that funny little curl in his tail. Um, and um, there's a lot of different names. Um, the FBI calls them victim recovery dogs, which I think really is taking it a little too far. Um, the very early uh, name was body dog, um, and that was in kind of early 80s that they were developed. Um, so what do they do? Um, well, they, they f help find dead people or forensic evidence. And um, there are still a lot of things that we don't know about why dead humans smell the way they smell. Um, there is some thinking when we look at some of these compounds, these organic compounds that make a dog say, oh, that's not a deer bone, that's a human bone, is some sulfur compounds that are kind of unique and, um, and uh, Arpad Voss, who's a forensic anthropologist, he was um, for many years at University of Tennessee, um, he's identified all of these separate compounds that come off a human body. It's, it's, it's great that we're so complex. Um, it becomes an interesting training problem um, because what is the dog alerting on, right? And I do know from training several dogs and watching others that um, bones that are up to a, more than a thousand years old, right? So the Mississippi Delta populations that that they were sort of our pyramids right here. Um, the mound civilizations, the first sort of Native Americans had bundle burials, and these places were all over. Actually, there's some not far from here, but all along the Mississippi Delta. Um, and those bones should have no volatiles coming off them, uh, but they do. And, um, and it's enough for a dog to say, 
that's a human bone. I know that it's, you know, a thousand years old, but it's human. Uh, and, but what you have to do, of course, is you have to expose the dog to that scent. And again, you're training on, if you're training on birch or anise, right, these compounds, what you're doing with cadaver dogs is you're over time saying, yes, fresh blood, yes, old teeth, yes, dry bone, right? And you're adding all of those things so the dog ultimately has a range of material, right? That they, uh, that they say, ah, this. Um, uh, the first time that I exposed Jocko, my current dog, to just a little bit of fresh blood on a bandage, and you know, I put it out uh, for several hours, and I was astonished um, because I had, you know, come around to put it so that he couldn't track back. And he just had no problem, even though that was new, going in and you could see his behavior change. And, you know, he got there and he sniffed it and there was that little, that moment, right? And he said, nah, I think this is it too, right? And so um, these are all the things um, that cadaver dogs can detect. Um, there are, if you have disaster dogs, Okay, so the FEMA dogs that come in, you actually don't want to train them on human blood uh, because there can be lots of blood in a building collapse. And what you want the dog to find is not just blood, but you want them to find um, people who are there, right? So you train the dog on for the purpose that it's going to have, right? Um, because I don't do disaster work, uh, I, I train on blood. Uh, because sometimes we, we will do forensic cases where it matters. Um, so, studies are really hard. <laughs> there aren't a lot. Um, these are three mouths um, uh, from Germany, from Hamburg. And um, it was a really beautiful little study where um, a couple of uh, guys dropped dead on the street. That was not the good part of the study. But they had agreed to donate their bodies to science and they were taken in and literally just wrapped in a fresh sheet and exposed to carpet squares for a very brief amount of time. So we are really talking about a kind of residual scent. The reason this is important is that people move bodies a lot, right? So, you know, somebody dies on your bed and then you think about it and then think, I better get this person moved, right? And so this was a case where uh, a husband claimed that his wife had fallen overboard and um, the dogs said, no, she died on the bed and um, and the prosecutor was really curious and so set up this study and quite literally if there's such a thing as perfume of death right these dogs were able to correctly identify a carpet square where a dead person was on it for just two minutes and taken away and for months they actually were able to correctly detect um, those squares. And again, this is, um, this is just that, that like, what are the outer limits? These are well-trained dogs and the dogs, just to go back to, right, K, the third uh, mouth here, was young and she, and she was correct 90% of the time. The other two dogs were correct 100% of the time, right? Um, um, I threw this slide in because I just love this dog. So, um, this is um, uh, Brad and his dog, Dreyfus, who's cross-trained in bomb and cadaver because it's a sheriff department that doesn't have a ton of money. Um, and, um, and Dreyfus has had a number of recoveries um, and is just a lovely, lovely dog and um, has done demos in rooms with like 200 people sitting in the room and, and you let Dreyfus go and he absolutely ignores all the people and heads out and, 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 and finds the material. So um, 
one of the things that we're learning is that, and one of the things I, I when I went into doing research on the book, I went as a kind of skeptic. Uh, I was a newspaper reporter. There's a lot of stuff that I don't believe. Um, I didn't automatically go, oh, the dog's nose beats them all. I really went out and said, okay, what are the machines? What are we doing, right? And I think that Ken Furton's quote here is really relevant, that um, he really thought they could come up with a machine that did what the dog's nose does. Um, and they still haven't. And part of it is not just about the dog. Um, the Pentagon also did a study. They had wasted literally billions of dollars trying to find a machine that did a better job of detecting IEDs. Um, and they, what they realized that was that local informants, the handler, and the dog, and the trained soldier keeping an eye out brought bomb detection up to 80%. We know about the 20% and what happens. They can't get it much higher than 80%. Part of what happens is that with IEDs, they change recipes, right? So you're keeping the dog trained up. It's always a, 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 a mashup. Um, but I kind of love the fact that it's not just the dog, right? You don't just, um, you don't just send the dog out and tell it to come back and report to you, right? It's this combination of awareness and everything else. So, so, so what are the problems with using dogs? Um, the problems with using dogs are that there are humans. So, so one of the problems with humans <laughs> is that we have a tendency to signal to our dogs a lot. This is the notion of stuff going down the leash, right? We all know that about obedience or anything else, right? Fear travels down the leash, whatever. Everything travels down the leash, but dogs are so good at picking up any tiny little thing. And it's called, um, the Clever Hans effect, and this had to do with uh, early 1900s. There was a math. How many of you are familiar with Clever Hans, the draft horse? A couple of you. It's a really important study because this horse was amazing. He could do math. He was a gorgeous, smart horse. That was his math teacher um, uh, owner. And Clever Hans would paw out the answer, right? If Tuesday falls uh, this year on, a, you know, on the fourth of each month, what year, right? Those kinds of questions. And, and Hans could answer these questions always. What happened is that his owner became increasingly delusional and actually believed that Hans could do this. And he actually believed that Hans understood a couple different languages. The horse, additionally, was so smart that he started feeding off both his owner and the audience. So the horse could, and there were huge crowds, right? You can imagine the bated breath, the, right? And the horse would know exactly when to stop pawing. Right? And so it took a psychologist uh, uh, a very long time to come up with a brilliant report. Well, this, this is what happens. This is what happens when, um, when you have a canine handler who decides that his dog is perfect, okay? And, um, and knows where the hides are, right? and is able, right, to go in and whatever unconscious thing that this person does, the dog can just read that signal. And it's why we do something in, in training called double blind, okay? Just like scientific studies have to be double blind, when you have detection dogs, what you need to be doing is you don't know where the hide is, okay? the person with you doesn't know where the hide is. Because I've had tra trainers 
who are training the handler want the success of you and the dog, they're giving off, as, like the audience in Clever Hans, they're giving off signals as well, right? So it's that notion that, that the dog needs to, in detection, have no information coming from the handler, <laughs> no information coming from the trainer, right? So it's just using its nose. And you can see one of the things that, you know, w dogs want to police us. That's, you know, and, um, and they're actually really good at wanting to get at their rewards. So it's one of the things where um, you can actually watch dogs that are too tuned into their handlers, right, and are looking back constantly. A dog will inevitably, most dogs, as great as they are, when they find something, and you'll see a little video, their solo always just went back and looked at me immediately. I couldn't get him. I could never get that beautiful little narcotic dog stare. But even narcotics dogs that are really good, they'll have their nose, the drugs here, they're here, and their eyes are rolling to the back of their head because they're waiting for the ball to come over, right? They know they shouldn't move their nose. Um, so these are, there's a whole lot of myths. The blood, a bloodhound can be a wonderful, wonderful dog. They're getting overbred. We all know what happens to dogs when um, they turn into, from working dogs into show dogs. And sadly, the bloodhound has, has not completely, but almost been ruined. We're watching people getting good success with mashups of coonhounds and bloodhounds, right? But the thing about the do that the bloodhounds nose is the very best is, is really just a myth, right? There's actually the few studies that are out there show that it actually depends on the dog. It doesn't depend on the breed and um, because a lot of bloodhounds these days don't have the kinds of drive and they're nervy and they're in bad health, right? Um, there are great bloodhounds out there and they're just a joy to watch. But um, one of the things that happens is that if you think about a patrol dog versus a bloodhound, bloodhounds are asked to do one thing. We assume that bloodhounds aren't gonna mind, they're, right? They're, you know, no obedience, how many, right, how many, high obedience levels, right? We don't expect the bloodhound to mind. We want them to do one thing, right? We want them to trail or track. And there is a real strength to a, training a single purpose dog. Patrol dogs have to recognize up to like 12 different drugs they've gotta be able to bite. They have to do short tracks and training time is severely limited, right? And so if you do get a good trailing or tracking bloodhound, it's great because that's all they do, right? And they can be very, very good at it. Um, two days ago, just before I came here, um, I saw, I, I see these and I just, I just wanna cry. No, dogs cannot figure out if something is child porn, okay? I know that, was it Justice Stewart who said about pornography, I know it when I see it. And you know, dogs know it when they smell it. This was one of those um, Fox News stories about dogs being able to detect flash drives. And because of course they can, right, if they're trained on those metal components, they can find hidden flash drives or CDs, right? But they, they don't know what child porn smells like. And this is a case that still haunts us. I have been in the past on crime scenes where a slightly suspicious cop has turned to me and said, wasn't there that case? And Sandy Anderson had this cadaver dog named Eagle. And, um, sh and it was a very, very good cadaver dog. It was a mix of Doby and I think um, maybe short hair pointer. What happened was that um, Sandra started loving the limelight a little too much and she started planting evidence at crime scenes and um, bone and blood. And she 
they had to open so many cases across the United States because the FBI loved her and used her a lot and she was actually used on cases in Central America even. And, um, and, and the problem was that her dog was just fine, right? The dog knew how to recognize this stuff, but the problem was that Sandy um, started loving being a celebrity. Um, and a really smart cop on a 10-year-old case uh, grew suspicious of her and followed her around and saw her slide her hand down into her boot and pull out a bone to plant at the scene. So, breeds. This is my Jocko right now. Um, and um, yeah, he's kind of, he's kind of a one-trick pony. I was telling somebody he, that he's not all that smart, which is true. <laughs> um, he's, he's kind of like, he's kind of got a Labrador soul in a German Shepherd body, so, um, so, so, but he, but it makes for actually a great scent detection dog because he wants to do one thing. That's, you know, go out and find it. Um, so I have seen so many breeds be successful at this work. What are the limitations? Well, the limitations are that you shouldn't have your bulldog okay, probably work in the wilderness in North Carolina, <laughs> okay. You should think about things like I got into an email exchange until I thought, oh my God, this is like, this is a hole I'm going to go down. A woman who had a Cocker Spaniel, and I've known a couple, I know a very good Cocker Spaniel cadaver dog, but she's in Canada and she says, this dog's nose cannot be wasted, I must. I must use this dog for this work. And I told her who the local people were up in Canada, and I got a long, angry email back from her saying that they insist that the dog be able to jump this high. Well, why would that be? Why would you have to have a dog in the Canadian wilderness that can jump this high, right? And she's outraged that they won't take the dog, and it's sort of like, well, honey, if you want to do this work, move to an area that's really flat where there's no fallen trees that the dog's going to have to get over, and we can talk. But part of, part of the issue is, is that the, the scent work is the easy part in some ways, right? It's all the stuff that the dogs have to do around it, right? Being, having environmental awareness, being able to ignore distractions, thinking people are not interesting if they're out on a search. I had a search with Solo, which was with electric fences and six or seven horses, right? And, um, and he had to be able to pay attention just to the work. And one of the... <laughs> One of the things, because I was standing there watching him work, and there was stuff that was interesting him over in the corner, and I could hear the zit, zit, zit of him hitting the electric fence. And this was an electric fence that was, uh, that was for a stallion. And the cop looked at me, and I said, well, I said, he's interested, <laughs> right? He, he's right, that electric fence, and it's not that you want a dog that completely ignores danger, but the fact is is that he was in a spot where he thought it was pretty interesting and the fence was irrelevant to him. Um, and, and you also need to know what the weaknesses of your dog are, because every dog has weaknesses, right? Solo was dog aggressive. I would if I was going into, I was went into an area to do a search where, where it was a meth lab and there were fighting cocks and there were pit bulls. And I wasn't worried about the fighting cocks, but you know, I said to the cops, are all the pit bulls removed, right? And they assured me that they were, right? And um, would it be ideal that if I could have said, just because I, I'm working him off lead, that I could say, Solo, don't even look at them, right? No, you kind of have to say, okay, this is one of the things that the dog might do. So, be cognizant of limits. There's Solo at the age of 
10, and that was about the time I retired him. And um, I retired him because um, he was getting gimpy. And he was 10, and he could no longer work all day. And I didn't want to say to somebody who called, well, if it's just a half an acre, he can do it. Because searches always end up not just being a half an acre. Pretty soon somebody's saying, I saw buzzards over there, right? So I had to make a very hard decision to say, this is the day that I say no more, no more searches. Um, and we're going to look about foundation work and show you a couple of videos and open up for questions. This is, uh, this is Durham PD, and this is a very nice little, um, still fairly green dog. And you can see that he needs to work a little. Do you see how his head is flipping back? We don't want that, right? And you s Mike is there about to reward him, but um, Danny's a little irked because there's Rin staring back at him. And he writes, so that's something that the dog needs. I think Danny had him just, um, that was interesting, just a couple of days, a uh, couple of weeks when he was doing him. So let's, I'm gonna set these videos up. This is, um, this is a, a system that's called the Randy Hare system of box work. Has anybody, is anybody familiar with uh, the Randy Hare? So just to explain to you, you see these lined up boxes and you see these little holes, okay? And there are plastic lids there. And what you'll see is, um, this is Jax, who, and I hope these work, who's really a little monkey. This is a 15 month old Roddy. And, um, my trainer Lucy has him and she put a little cadaver material in one of these boxes, right? And so here's what happens. And she's actually operating. Do you see that tennis ball popping around? Okay, so he comes, he goes, oh, tennis ball, tennis ball, tennis ball. And she bugs him with it, right? And he goes, oh, tennis ball, tennis ball. And then he goes, oh, wait a second. What was I doing? I was supposed to be looking for scent, <laughs> right? I, I forgot. This is like the third time he's been on these boxes. Now watch. See that head? That's the scent. The ball comes down a chute, right? The handler is completely removed from this equation, okay? And you'll see, now this is maybe his fourth time on the boxes. Watch what happens. She's teasing with the ball, the scent's not in that box. And he goes, ooh, this is a ball. And then see how much more quickly now he's ignoring the ball? Okay, now watch what happens here. She's really bugging him. Bad Lucy. All right, and he's having trouble because he's trying to ignore the ball now. And he goes, oh, right? So this is what, please, okay? So, and watch his handler, quote unquote, back up. She's now six feet away from him. What he's getting, he's getting rewarded only at source, and he's not getting rewarded by that toy until his nose is right over that. So he's just getting nice whiffs of the thing. So th this, is, this, is, this is Pavlov at work, right? This is beautiful operant conditioning, and it's one of the things that makes um, this kind of work when you're early on laying a foundation or you just want to actually introduce a new odor to a dog, right? Say you've been going on birch and you're gonna introduce a second odor. Doing something like this is such a good way because the dog will go, I think this is interesting. Bam, the ball comes down, right? And the dog immediately knows. And um, the other thing I want to show you, this is, um, this is a retired canine, Roddy, from Vermont. And um, this is a little geeky science stuff. But what you do is the top one is, do you see where the green grass is by, by the back end of those cones? And you see where the smoke bomb is, OK? So the smoke bomb is exactly where the drug was placed. All right, and I want to show you what happens to scent. And whoops, I don't want to do that. I, let me see if I can 
do a little better job of that. Okay, so <coughs> look what happens. Look at where that scent is going. And when Hallie was talking about the dog is the expert, right, you think, oh, that's pretty easy. Look at how that scent is switching around. Now, this is slow-mo, so he solved this problem in about 10 seconds. But there's, he's not in scent, right? And look at the way it flips around. And then he comes and he goes, oh, I've got it. And there, bam. But it's one of the things where when we want to sort of geek out, if we think scent conditions are interesting, putting a smoke bomb out afterwards starts to humble you because you go, oh, I put the thing out and the dog's just going right past it, right? And then you put the smoke bomb out and you go, oh, oh, now I see. Now I see how this happened. So this is just a couple minutes. This is solo. And he did do, his was a down, Hallie. So this is, um, this is just a little thing in finding teeth. Um, but you'll see as he comes around here, this was just a training, um, but there was a, a, it was nice camera. You'll watch him slow down here. Right there, see his back roached <laughs> and slow and there was something there was something down in the river okay that he went and subsequently found but one of the things I used and still use is teeth can be really important for identification purposes and so these are just two teeth um, they have to have pulp in them obviously because enamel isn't very interesting for the dog and You'll see him come in, and right there, he hits the scent cone, right? It's on the other side of that little tree. That was for artistic effect. Um, and he's got his nose on him, and down, right? And um, one of the things Hallie was talking about is that notion of you get your final indication, which you kind of need for court purposes, you could tell immediately that that dog was in scent, right? That final down is just um, the icing on the cake. Um, and what he would do, bam, he found something. He just trained himself because I was too slow out in the woods. He would go back and find me and bring me back, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, was, it, 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 it worked beautifully. So let's, um, I'm going to go through these slides a little quickly because I know it's been a long day. I want to just look at some of the purposes. Um, uh, L'Ambience Plaza in Connecticut, um, uh, first use of cadaver dogs. They helped pinpoint, interestingly enough, I was on this scene as a newspaper reporter. I never knew that what cadaver dogs were for 20 years after that, but um, this was a terrible, terrible disaster with what's called lift slab construction, where you use jacks with pre-poured concrete to raise each level up. And these, um, I think a-holes is the term, had workers underneath because they were behind schedule. They had workers working underneath and one of the jacks failed twisting everything and bringing um, this building down on top of um, all these workers. Um, also mudslide, I don't know how many of you remember this from Washington in uh, March 2014. Um, a mile square destruction, the side of a mountain basically collapsed down into a river valley. Um, this, is little, um, this is little raven who, as you can tell, had a ball. Um, these were terrible, terrible search conditions. Um, and um, sadly, uh, it's like a tidal wave. Bodies were utterly destroyed in this. Um, houses gone. Um, uh, it was silica mud, and so um, sort of like little flat slate things all over. It's very hard for scent to get up 
in that. And so very often it was where a tree would provide an opportunity for scent to travel up that the dogs could alert. And then you begin to realize that, you know, a dog can't necessarily get his nose right over the thing. That may not be where the scent is coming from. The same is true of water work. Um, again, a really, I think that a good water dog is absolutely irreplaceable. Um, it doesn't matter how cold the water is. Um, it really, um, and again, the dog can't necessarily pinpoint where the body is, but as opposed to where the scent is strongest. Um, uh, and you throw buoys down and um, you can get within shouting distance. Um, unmarked graves. Um, I've had people work on this for, for instance, for slave graveyards where, um, where there's simply no marker. Um, and and uh, we did actually some stuff in Wilmington, North Carolina, where they were going to widen a road and needed to figure out where there might be um, uh, uh, unmarked graves for that. Uh, Again, really diffuse scent. Um, it's why, for instance, in nose work, buried is the last thing you do because, um, because it's really difficult. Um, clandestine graves. Again, um, uh, just as Arpad Vas said, the nemesis uh, for um, FBI and everybody else, being able to um, locate where somebody is buried um, Dogs can really help narrow the area, but that notion of, of how close they can get really depends on water table and everything else. Um, and I've been out on these cases, and they are, they are just rough. Um, uh, demonstrating goodwill. This is Strega. She um, belonged to Kathy Holbert, who has wonderful working shepherds up in West Virginia. And this was um, the first time that um, cadaver dogs had been used for uh, an American conflict. And um, Strega had to be, as you can imagine, retrained because she's in West Virginia, um, usually finding whole bodies, lost hunters, suicides. Um, all of a sudden, she's dealing with trying to make recoveries from IEDs going off um, and, and in conditions that are hot and dry versus right humid. Um, she did beautifully. Um, again, uh, I, I love Andy Redman. He wrote the book on cadaver dogs and he's been out on probably a couple thousand searches. Um, this was a case where he, that little dog, Josie, um, helped find um, three women. Um, there were 11 women who were sex workers addicted to heroin and cocaine who were picked up then strangled and dumped on the sides of highways. Um, and Andy helped recover the, these women. And he loved this little dog. She, he said she was the easiest dog he'd ever been able to train. She just, she just got it immediately. And she did both live find and cadaver. She didn't care. Um, and water, again, this is, a, this is a recovery that was, that, that they were starting to suspect the family. They could not find this woman's body. Um, uh, and it was the dogs that were able to pinpoint and they put down a, a robot, um, and the body was 230 feet down. Okay, um, and again, this is you know it's not rocket science exactly. We decompose and we send up signals, right? Decomposing cells send up gases. They hit the surface of the water, and the dog says, "There's somebody there," right? Um, how many of you have seen the movie Fargo? So this is the case that Fargo was based on. This was in Connecticut. Uh, pilot murdered his flight attendant wife, uh, froze her body, put her through a wood chipper on the side of the Housatonic River uh, with lots of wood. And um, Andy Redman was called in with his dog, Lady. And they pulled all the wood chip piles in. And she sorted through all those wood chip piles 
and they found 60 chips of bone and strands of blonde hair and a fingernail that they were able to, Henry Lee was the forensic scientist in this case who did the O.J. Simpson, but they were able to match the fingernail. And um, this was the first time in Connecticut history that a convic conviction was made without having a body. And um, let, let me note, in cases like this, there's this point at which um, there's the husband. Um, he's still in prison, thank goodness. But the fact is, is that he went and rented a freezer and a wood chipper on his credit card. <laughs> so that would not have been enough, right? You, again, the dog was needed to help with this, right? But it's a, it's a whole team, right? Lady was one part. And I do love this story because Lady had a little bit of an edge and Andy had her tied up and was giving her a little bit of a break and, you know, and there's like a cop there. And Andy said, leave her alone. And the guy didn't, and lady bit him. <laughs> <laughs> so, and some of you, this was a case that just goes back to July. Uh, this was in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, and um, four young men were murdered by this young man and his cousin. And perhaps you read of this case, but essentially uh, the cousin and the young man um, uh, put three of the bodies into a huge sort of barbecue barrel and tried to burn them and that didn't work but they had a backhoe so they buried the barrel with the three bodies in it 12 and a half feet down okay and then put rocks on the top of that and um, and the DA said, and I think the DA, the DA was, was right, um, he, and this is the quote, I don't understand the science behind it, but those dogs could smell those poor boys 12 and a half feet below the ground. Now, goodness knows that they didn't really smell 12 and a half feet through the dirt. The dogs were able to get scent coming up from very loose soil and probably um, the burning didn't um, hurt being able to access that scent. But I, I do, I think that this is a, a great case of showing how useful these dogs can be. And this was, uh, this was one of the, there was a shepherd and a golden retriever, but I thought you would prefer the picture of the shepherd. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and before we open it to questions, just he, here's the final considerations. Going out on cadaver searches, most of the time you don't find anybody, okay? You're clearing areas, you're accustoming the dog to work long periods of time without being rewarded. Um, on cases that I worked with solo, I usually knew the law enforcement involved and so I would bring like a jar of body dirt along with me and have a cop be with me and I would set it out in an area away from the search so that if Solo had worked for an hour or so without a reward, I could just keep him searching and just happen to go over there and he'd say, oh my God, look what I found. Um, because he needed to be rewarded for his work. Um, and, um, and again, it's, it's the whole team, right? The dog can never go out on his own. It's the people who know where that body might be that help, right? A dog is a great tool for narrowing stuff down. So that's a, another picture of Jocko because, you know, I think he's a great looking dog. Um, and there's Solo. Um, you know, that was just after we did a search and that was just taking him away from everything and just giving him a good run. Um, and Mary Ellen and Gail and Ellen and Deborah, thank you so much. And I think we've got uh, a bit of time for questions. And I think we'll maybe do, do 20 minutes or so, but um, I know people are tired, so I will not be insulted if you walk away. Yes. Well, no, I can't give you a preview of what you're going to see tomorrow because 
I don't know what the weather conditions are going to be like. It is reportedly going to be raining pretty hard. Um, rain tamps down scent pretty awfully. And you saw solo working that problem, right? You, you, the air columns have to be forever in our favor. Um, yes, and it can, you know, it can be raining pretty hard um, and then clear off. And my favorite search conditions for whole bodies or even burials was a rain and then humidity, right, where the scent would just start pumping out again, right? But during the rain, it can be a little rough. So, uh, so Jan Meyer has a couple of dogs. She's got a couple of labs. Again, all dogs can do, yeah. <laughs> what can I say? Um, but she's got a sort of a beginning lab who's driving her nuts. And then she's got a lab who's been out on a number of cases. And um, we'll figure out a way to get them to work. And it's just, um, for any of you who have done, does, is everybody familiar with the term air scent dogs? Yeah. So th these dogs will do air scent. And then um, uh, there's a good search and rescue bloodhound that's a tracking trailing dog. And I think I'm going to lay a trail tonight. Um, and we'll see again, uh, you know, People who have even really good bloodhounds, a, a, a two-day-old trail, okay, is miraculous, all right? Beyond that, there are very, very few people who can say, I've, I've, I really was able to follow this trail. So a 24-hour-old trail is a hard trail to follow. So, so that's a, a preview. Hopefully it won't be. And it's going to be, where is it going to be? In the Schutzend? In the Schutz and Seeger field. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be from one to three. And, um, and we'll just hang out there no matter what to answer questions, even if the demo is a complete failure. And, and to talk about how to start dogs, right? Because there's, there, you know, there's a thousand ways to start dogs effectively. You don't need Randy Hare's system. Right? There's all sorts of ways to put foundation on. Um, and a lot of different trainers swear by their methods. Um, and really good trainers know to not say, I have the best system. <laughs> yeah? So, but for Zapper Dive, you, you do need humans. Yeah, ideally, there's um, a German company has something called Pseudoscent. Um, which has got some um, cadaverine and putrescine in it. And it's called just pseudoscent, like pseudo coffee, right? There's no caffeine in it. And, um, uh, but the ideal material is to have a range of the real thing. You have to be careful uh, depending on your state. There are laws um, uh, about what is legal to keep. Um, I, highly recommend for people interested in this work. There's a couple good universities that have um, uh, colloquially known as body farms, but research facilities where people donate their bodies and they get put out under different conditions. And um, there are now three different research facilities that actually do cadaver dog training. There's one in Western Carolina. Um, and um, it's a very good experience because, and I think Hallie um, talked about this, about the 25 pound brick of marijuana in a room and how hard it is for a dog. It's like a cloud of scent. The same thing is true for cadaver dogs that a whole body can be a pretty overwhelming thing because we train on what are sort of minor remains. We do not keep whole bodies in our freezer. Um, it's illegal and ill-advised. <laughs> I have kept material in my our freezer quadruple and packed and you know I've stolen containers from my husband and of course they can never be used for anything else again um, but one of the things about real life search conditions is that very often you are going out and looking for um, um, a whole person so dogs getting that exposure is really important um, you know, I have bone, I have teeth, I have blood, I am fortunate to have a relationship. We do training at the medical examiner's office and that gives us access. 
So, um, it, but mat finding good material and a range is, is one of the big challenges. That's nice music. <laughs> I got a hypothetical question based on your experience. If, if you took that case that they just had where the three boys were buried in the barrel, mm -hmm. 12 feet deep, mm -hmm. I wonder what would have happened if they buried a 300 pound pig six feet deep. Oh, so the pig case the pig case is interesting because of course people used to think because pigs have been such a sort of a research tool as analogous to humans because their skin is sort of like ours, etc. So the assumption was is that there are still people who train on pig remains. Um, pig remains are different than human remains. I wonder if when the police got to the pig, if they would have said, oh, that's Oh, I've been, there have been cases. And as a matter of fact, there have been cases where somebody has buried a dog and then two feet under that has put the person to, and, um, and you get down to the dog and you say, hey, we're done here, right? But I do know of a case where the human was a couple feet under the dog. So it would have, you know, here's the nice thing about criminals. Most of them aren't very smart. <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> it would, but but it has been done. The other thing that you need to think about, and and I had a very long conversation with a guy who's done many, many, many um, abduction cases, abduction murder cases, and um, realized that often in these cases you bring in everybody, right? So a young 14-year-old, usually white. Let's face it girl is abducted and she's usually killed within one to two hours of being abducted and usually put into a one and a half feet deep. That's sort of the standard. And they bring in all the dogs, they don't find anything, right? And it actually takes time for scent to travel up. So depending on the kind of soil, right, what they really need to do in those cases is actually bring the dogs back the following week because by then the scent will have worked up. And it really is an issue on some of these cases and an interesting one. Okay, but that's a little too much detail probably. Is there a, yes? What is one of the favorite cases that you have that you have, have worked? Um, I don't write about, I, I only wrote about one of the cases in the book in, in any detail. Um, I did have a case where we went out, and I, we went out, I think, 13 or 14 different times um, because the person kept giving us bad information or more information, and, um, and we were ultimately able to do a recovery, and that, it was a two-year period. Um, and often you don't get resolution like that. Um, so, um, so it felt so good. I went out on my birthday because the detective called me and said, right, and I said, it's my birthday, what a perfect thing to do. <laughs> and, and, it does, and it does give satisfaction because um, this was a case where nobody cared. Right, the detective cared, and the immediate family cared, um, and it was a it was a really sad case, but but that that meant a lot. So, yeah, I mean, criminal cases are hard because you just you I I am sometimes horrified when I see on Facebook the d details that get divulged by people. <laughs> Um, and I go, no, 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 this is still an open case. Please do not post a picture of your dog out on a search, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. And, and there were complaints from some readers that I didn't write about cases. And it's sort of like, well, there's a reason for that, right? They're, they're cases. Um, and that's why it was so nice to have all these really good, experienced handlers who were, and I write about them, Right, and these are cases that get solved. So, yeah. Where do you use the scent on the side for your dog? Are the dogs that do burn out just because of what they're having to do? No, no. So Properly trained dogs. To, I, the, uh, prop, the the stuff that came out um, after 9/11 was that the the ha there there weren't 
cadaver dogs. They went in on 9-11 thinking that there were going to be a lot of live people. They brought in a lot of live scent dogs. The handlers are stressed. The dogs are stressed. They're working the dogs too long. Um, then they got this. So it started the myth that the dogs got depressed because they found dead people. A properly trained cadaver dog, that's, that's like Christmas in July. That's like the very, why, I mean, why would a dog do this work if it depressed them? I mean, think, so this notion of that the dogs know and they realize, it's like to, to Solo, cadaver scent meant his tug toy, right? So it's a really great question. But again, I think that we, we get these notions partly because, of, of course, the handlers were exhausted, overwhelmed, those weren't cadaver dogs. The dogs were being worked way too long on um, just horrible conditions, right? Yes. Absolutely. And again, that's stuff that travels down the lead. But those, those were mostly live search dogs. Yeah. No, it's a great question. Let's, I'll take one more, and then I'm actually happy to sign books. More importantly, I have Solo's nose stamp. <laughs> Ah, this is such an interesting question. So I'm, I want to repeat this. I want to repeat this because, because I'm, I'm going to sound, OK, this is one of the interesting things I hear again and again. And, and I'm going to say what I think about it. Uh, and that the, the question is this. We walk into a room and we smell stew. The dog walks into the room and smells carrots and rosemary and uh, chopped up steak and whatever else is in the stew. No. <laughs> Not necessarily, right? When we talk about our nose versus a dog's nose, a, a dog has a whole lot more going on with turbinates and the, uh, uh, right, the, the number of cells that are dedicated to scent and all of those things. But we actually have really good noses, too. And I can actually walk into a room, if my husband is cooking stew, and call out some of the ingredients in that stew as well. So there, it's, it's both degree and a little bit of kind in terms of why the dog's nose is so much better than ours. But if we think about like a wine expert, think about what they're able to smell right, with an education. And one of the things that I think that's wonderful about scent work that is just amazing to me is the difference between a green dog and an advanced dog is that dogs get better and better and better at this as they get more educated. And you can watch a dog, an advanced dog, start to solve more complex search problems more quickly and be able to just sort of find more stuff. And that's partly um, that the nose gets educated, right? Just like we can educate our noses and do, right? Um, so um, I hear that from actually even experienced dog people. I kept trying to chase down that, but I think that it's just weirdly a myth. I mean, we do know, for instance, you can train a drug dog up on, like, on 17 different kinds of drugs, right? And what they're able to do is not necessarily break down all the components of cocaine, but, you know, here's cocaine and here's ecstasy and, you know, and here's meth and here, right? Um, so I think that that may be part of it, that dogs somehow break that stuff down. Um, so thank you so much. I know that it's been a long day.